Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by my friend Rob Hart. Rob, welcome to the show. Hey, Bart. Thanks for having me. Sure. So you are a musician, an educator, an entrepreneur, and uh, you're here today mainly to talk about your lessons that you took with the great Tony Williams in the kind of early to mid 90s, right? Yes. So our our, our key kind of takeaway that we're after today is really um, talking about how you've translated your lessons with this icon, this just there's there's no other word except legend <laughs> of a drummer and how you're now using his techniques and the lessons that you've used to teach kind of uh, modern drummers today, which I think is just so cool that you're carrying on his his tradition, really. Yeah, um, I was fortunate to be able to study with Tony uh, in the Bay Area um, at a place called Drum World and um, and another place called SIR, Studio Instrument Rentals. And mm. that was a, um, a rehearsal studio over in San Francisco in the main part of, of downtown. And Santana, all these big groups would would rehearse there. Um, so that was yeah, 1992 when I when I started taking lessons. Cool, wow, this is neat because uh, so I, I got to say that I mean, if you listen to the show, you, I'm sure you probably listen to uh, meaning the listeners. You probably listen to the great episode uh, that was a biography on Tony with um, Dave Goodman, who just, just did his thesis on him, and it's a very detailed biography. This episode kind of. Uh, obviously it builds on it because it's about Tony, but we're talking more about, we we have examples that you've prepared from his clinics, which I love when there's uh, these audio examples so we can hear from the man himself. But um, it's, it's kind of neat to do. I, I had it happen with Gene Krupa where, where there was multiple episodes, George way to really fill out this person's life and hear about his lessons and him as a person. So before we even start, I just want to ask, what was it like, Going to day one, lesson one with Tony Williams. I mean, were you nervous? Well, the very beginning, um, you know, we used to see him play. He'd play in San Francisco a bunch. He lived in Pacifica and he was playing like gigs all over the place. And so um, the story goes is that uh, I was at, uh, there was a a club called uh, Kimball's West which was a jazz club in San Francisco that's actually down the street from what's called now SF Jazz. And um, I went up to him and I asked him, are you teaching? And he said, no. Hmm. Um, the very next gig was at a place called Bay Jones, which was over in um, the Mission in San Francisco. And he had a sign-up sheet for classes. So um, a little bit of the theme of... of, of studying with Tony was, you know, some contradiction. And so, no, I'm not teaching lessons. Here's the sign up sheet. So (laughs) I signed up and then I started classes. Um, I was, you know, I was, I was probably very nervous, but at the same time, just hanging out with Tony was like a dream come true. Just being in the room with him, you know, um, he was larger than life. And, um, you know, that alone, I think, you know, as you kind of got comfortable, you know, you, you know, we kind of had, a, a what I say, like, like, I got more comfortable with, with asking questions and, and, and being around him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you were more like, I don't know, when you first meet anyone who's like an idol, you, you kind of have to be this perfect version of yourself. So I'm sure you could open up more and ask what are, probably you thought were like silly questions just to get to the truth of, you know, his, his style and all that stuff. So what was a, um, people love hearing this. I, I got to ask, I always get, you, you didn't ask how much it costs. How much did a lesson with Tony typically cost in, in 1992? Well, I forget what the classes were. Um, I, I, I remember there was a guy named Lee that, um, uh, John to Christopher who, who used to work for Jillian told me, mm-hmm that he was his um, drum tech at the time. I remember having a receipt, but I don't remember how much that particular lesson or that class was. Uh, I don't think it was that much, but when we did private lessons, it was $100 an hour at the time. And this was in the 90s. So that was was, um, pretty, that was not cheap, but well worth it. Yeah, interesting. Um, Okay. 
Well, that's good to know. That's I know it's kind of a weird question, but it's come up where, you know, Freddie Gruber and uh, Joe Morello and people like to say it, it's kind of puts you in that that moment of um, but you're you're paying for quality in an hour. You can get a lot done. And I guess the really the key thing is, is when you leave and practice, it's what you maybe you feel more inclined. Like I just paid whatever the equivalent of two hundred dollars today, whatever it is. Uh, I better practice. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um. You know, the thing about that was that you knew that this is a once in a lifetime thing. And, um, you know, we all went for it. And uh, there is a, there is a, a, you know, of course, I talked about the sign of a sheet. There was also, he put a little ad, there's a local magazine called BAM Magazine, Bay Area Music. He put a little ad in the BAM Magazine. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, you would call his service. So you'd call up, you'd leave a message, and he would call you back. And that's how you booked your lessons. He didn't have, you know, there wasn't a, a secretary or anything like that or a manager. He would actually call you back and book it. Um, wow. So he was handling all that business himself. That's interesting. I mean, you want to you want to spread your your knowledge, but also you can't uh, just gig all the time. You obviously can, but I'm sure he was at a point where he wanted to teach and spread the knowledge and um, teach the next generation. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And he was, um, in the lessons, he was videotaping, uh, all the lessons. And he was saying that he was creating a course for, uh, uh, for college, for, for drumming and the history and the tradition of drumming. And he was Hmm. working on that before he passed away. Yeah. I mean, it goes without saying that this is pretty close to the end of his life, which he did die relatively early. He was not that old, but, um, you know. That's that's interesting. It's very sad that he was working on that and he he didn't. I mean, 94, he died in you ended your lessons in 94. He died in 1997. So, boy, you were pretty close to the end of his life. Yeah. Without even knowing it. Right. And yeah. uh, uh, terrible. That was that was. Yeah. It was just something that that I remember my student. This is how I find out about stuff. My student came into his lesson and said, Tony Williams had passed away and I just could not believe it. You know, I go, no, this cannot be true. And he goes, oh yeah, it just, it just happened. So, Mm. so yeah, I mean, you know, as, as you know, things are, people pass away quickly sometimes and, you know, it's just unbelievable. Like we just lost Chick Corea, you know, who was so vibrant and, and, you know, gigging all the time and, and, you know, not, not ever slowing down and all of a sudden gone, you know? So, yeah. No, and especially with Tony with the routine gallbladder surgery, I believe it's just like, you know, anyone, your friend, your parent, your child, whoever could could have that surgery and you never you never know. But um, um, I guess last question about his lessons and then we'll jump into the the audio examples and, and start chugging forward. But um, how was his like demeanor as a teacher? Was it very uh, like some people say there's you know, there's stern i don't want to say mean teachers but there's kind of drill sergeant style where did he fall into that you know well um he he could be very strict and and then on the other end he was he would relax and and he would just be you know hanging man and we'd be talking and and just chatting you know um so i saw the two sides of him Uh, i remember doing like in the uh the uh classes doing calling he'd call everybody up one at a time and we work on the practice pad and do rudiments and i remember him like we're working on a, a flam tap or a, a flam accent and he would go you're balancing don't bounce you're playing the <laughs> sticking wrong and he'd you know he'd just be drilling you i know i think i'm doing it right you know so um he could be very very strict but at the same time at the end of that that class at the end of that series he was like you guys are all doing really great and he was very That's happy nice. and, and he would meet you in the lobby and go, Hey, how you doing? And so, uh, you know, I saw the two sides where, you know, if, if somebody took his picture, there was one time at drum world where somebody was trying to take his picture while I was going into my lesson and he got pretty upset and he mm. said, stop now. I didn't ask, I didn't say you could take my picture. And then he, he look at me and goes, you, you go in the room. <laughs> <laughs> your tail is between your legs like yeah, yes yeah. sir <laughs> yeah well you know it was just you know he he yeah. he had a certain um he demanded respect as you hear on one of my 
uh, audio clips. He demanded respect. And, um, you know, if, if something happened, he wasn't going to have it. If it was something he didn't like, he would speak up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, he's the man he has produced, uh, so much great music and, and students such as yourself that, uh, it worked. And sometimes, uh, it's come up on the show where it's like, if you're too soft on students, then that's maybe not the best thing. Cause you're not learning as much as you can having your, you know, handheld through everything. You need a little, uh, Oh boy, I need to practice. Uh, I did not, you know, Tony was not happy with me, but it, it's, it's nice that the end he kind of you're doing good, you know, he, he sour than sweet kind of thing, right? <laughs> yeah. I think that he that he had traditional things that he grew up on. You know, he grew up at such a young age and um as David said, you know, he saw everybody play and that's how he learned. Yeah. So, um he had all these traditional things that he was very, you know, um passionate about and I think he was really passionate about passing that stuff on. Mhm. Mm God, yeah, his life was just so fascinating. Having the, the a mom that was so young and she would be at school and he'd be going off to New York to play. I mean, that's we could again, that's the whole other episode, but fascinating life. But so um I'd love to jump in and you kind of take the 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 wheel here and let's start uh talking about what you've got prepared here and we'll we'll go through these clips and this is this is awesome. Okay, well, I've got a lot of clips, and I just wanted to start off with um, clip number one, where he's talking about uh, incorporating roles and playing even. So he would go through um, the double stroke roll, and his hands were amazing. I mean, he, he would just play the snare drum and just blow you away. But he would do things where, um, you know, he would do one, one uh, voice at a time, then he'd move to the tom, then he'd move on to the next tom, and then the floor tom, then he'd incorporate, you know, cymbals and bass drum and different things. So yeah. in this first clip, he talks about um, incorporating roles, and there's kind of a couple of themes in these, these clips. Um, the ride cymbal is a big part of his playing and in incorporating the ride cymbal. And um, the other thing is, is the hands and keeping the hands even and, and, you know, where he positions his hands and, and, um, you know, the traditional grip and how he utilizes things. So, um, I, I really get a lot out of his playing all these rudiments, but keeping everything even. So the first clip is going to utilize that about using roles. So maybe you can play that first one. Yeah. And now where, where is this clip? So we know, um, maybe what year and what, what, uh, where was this clinic? So. The clinic was at um, this place called E. Wurlitzer in Boston, and um, it was in uh, 1982. And okay. I was attending Berkeley College of Music, and um, they would have they actually had a whole week of clinics at this at this shop. Um, so it was Tony Williams, um, it was Simon Phillips, it was Peter Erskine um lenny mm. white and so they you wow. know like every <laughs> it was I, I think it was amazing. like a, a a week or maybe a couple week series of clinics and they had this big room upstairs so mm. um everybody went to this so this was like the thing wow. to do uh you know for for the whole yeah. school <laughs> yeah it sounds like it man okay so um here we go this is clip number one <laughs> yeah, yeah. After I mean, that was good. I mean, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was made so I could hear it. And then I started playing more roles and finding out. Like after the records after that, I don't know. I mean, I noticed it, but after that, I started using more, more roles and things and trying to find out because everything I was playing was. Like, and it, it really annoyed me after I heard it. I cried. <laughs> oh, I cried. That's funny. Wow. Cool. That's a great clip. It's neat to hear him talk. You know what I mean? I love being able to put the, a voice to him instead of just just talking about him. So that's really cool. Yeah. And, and um, I think in that clip, his main point was that he played a lot of staccato things and, and, mm -hmm. and I think like a lot of um, single strokes and, and whatnot. And he was talking about how, you know, he was in start, starting to incorporate rudiments and rules 
and and the beauty of the role in the playing. And so um, he talks about how when he listens back to himself with Miles, you know, in the early recordings, he didn't like it. You know, he mm. he 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 didn't he didn't like his playing because he thought it was just too staccato and too too sticking. And he kind of played a little bit there of of you know playing some single strokes. Yeah. Man, I mean, everyone else who's listening to this goes, no, you sounded pretty good, Tony. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but he's he's constantly progressing uh, in his in his own, you know, drumming journey. So good for him for sticking, <laughs> being tough on himself. Yeah. And, you know, his I think the other thing and, and this is a, you know, uh, a thing that I, you know, I see in my teachers and my mentors is that. You know, with Tony, he he didn't stay in one thing. He 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 evolved, and he kept evolving. Um, and so, you know, here's this one point when he was 17. You know, and and he's in New York, and you know, um, he's he's getting the gig with Miles, and and he's developing this style, and you know, um, developing you know uh, all these different kinds of ways of playing that are innovative. Right? Nobody was doing it. Now he's getting stuff from his, you know, his uh, mentors, and then he's bringing that forward. And then he yeah. he goes into another thing where he's going into avant-garde and experimental things, you know. And then he's going yeah. into electric, and he's and he's you know playing louder and more, um, you know, fusion type of stuff. Then he gets into you know going back into playing straight ahead again, you know, with his his uh, uh, quintet, and then and then you know going on to to being a symphonic composer. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, he was eventually going to write for movies. He was going to be a film composer. Boy, that would have been cool. Mm. That would have been amazing. It's like when you think you've figured out what's going on, he's already moving on to the next thing, you know, like you can't keep up with him. So, wow. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, shall we continue here with the next clip? You want to set this one up a little bit? Yeah. So this next one is about, um, the importance of traditional grip. Now, okay. Uh, I want to say that, um, you know, I've been teaching for about 35 years and I don't force grips on people, but, um, if you listen to Buddy Rich and you listen to, you know, um, some of the traditional things from that time period, traditional grip was, you know, really something that was emphasized, you know, mm -hmm. um, I had to play traditional grip when I grew up, there was no, like, can you choose kind of thing? It was never a yeah. choice for us. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what it was like for you growing up. Um, no, it was it was match grip. There was no, I guess it was my teacher. I mean, I was taking lessons and I mean, it would have been started in the l late 90s. And it was like, I mean, I was a pretty little kid, but it was like, didn't even come up. Yeah. What happened with this is that he he did this in several clinics. He talked about how he he thought that people who played match grip weren't interesting to him that he he felt that the uh, traditional grip was really you know made the drummers very interesting and, and caught his attention so you know it's really about the importance of incorporating all techniques in your playing yeah i mean i always wish that it, to me and it sounds <laughs> kind of dumb but like it looks cooler to me traditional grip like it just looks prettier it looks more t traditional <laughs> you know like like very classic, but, um, that being said, it is what it is, but it's, it's, I, I get where he's coming from. I mean, it's definitely, a it, it goes with the, the classical style of, of drumming for sure. Yeah. Okay. Here comes clip number two about traditional grip. Okay. Traditional grip, because I see, oh, you know, there's a, con there is a concept which I don't subscribe to which says, well, if this hand is this hand, this hand is this hand, why don't we, why don't, why aren't we able to do everything the same on both sides? Um, guys, you know, I mean, that's great. Let me explain this right. <laughs> See, I enjoy the fact that I have a right side and I have a left side. And making those two work together to make music is more important to me than this side appearing to be separate from this side. And the people that I've seen that play exclusively match grip for everything, well, let me put it another way. There's a whole tradition and there's a, a lot of vocabulary already built up that you play by holding the stick like this. 
And because the mind works the way it does, I think, if you hold the stick this way with this hand, you're not going to think of those things. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when, you're, when I hold my stick this way, my mind thinks a certain way. If I hold it this way, I click into something else. I use both. And I, and I would like everybody to be able to use both. The reason most more people don't use the traditional grip is because it feels awkward. That's the only reason. A lot of people say, well, you don't need it, you know. But I think, it, I think that's a cop-out. I think it, the, more you can, the more you know how to play, the better you are. The match grip is, I mean, it's great. The match grip is, uh, it's all, I mean, I see a big advantage in learning how to play this way. Can you explain what he's talking about with the vocabulary that you unlock with just traditional and just with match? Like what, what is, cause I mean, I'm again, a match grip player. I can do a little traditional, like with brushes, it feels awkward. He's hit the nail on the head there. I just, I haven't really fully, I know that if I put more time in, it would be unlocked, but what is that vocabulary that he's talking about there? Well, you know, he's talking about having, you know, opposite sides and, and how it it's, a lot of the theme of his style and his playing is, is making things, you know, um, challenging. And I think mm. the reason that, uh, he found the traditional grip, um, you know, very, you know, gave him this, this facility is because it made him play a certain way. And, and, you know, he got, there was a certain feel that he got from playing traditional grip. There's a certain feel he got from playing match grip. Now, if you watch him playing, you'll see that he switches over to match grip for um, playing power, right? Mm. But if you see him go back to the snare drum and, and just play rudiments on the snare drum or going through stickings, he's playing traditional grip. Mm. Um, the other thing I want to mention, a lot of people talk about um, what is called the uh, hanger grip, and he played from the back of his hand. And so... A lot of times, you know, we're learning about all these different techniques that are um, the fulcrum based and everything and, and, you know, rebounding the stick and, and, you know, different kinds of techniques like that. He was more, um, he watched people play, you know, and his, his upbringing was watching players play. And he came up with um, his observation of seeing that people were playing from the back of their hand, from their pinky and their ring finger. And so he was basing his, his hands on that. And then he was playing thumbs up, but he wasn't playing uh, French grip. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was this, this, this grip that, that, you know, he did, he was able to do. And, and, and mostly when I teach, I teach putting the thumbs up a timpani grip where, you know, we, th- we call it the French grip. And I think most people know about that where it's all fingers. Yeah. So I think in general, he's, he's talking about, you know, how he clicks into these different grips and how it makes him play different and it gives him a different feel. Hmm. Yeah. It's just like, he's mastered the, like using all the tools in your tool belt for what might be to, you know, someone not as experienced kind of a, a minute difference, but he's getting, I mean, he's so it's just so perfect the way he can change and do all that, that it, it's, it's, it's great that he's using, uh, he's just a master, you know, to, to fully utilize all these techniques. Yeah. And he, um, like I said before, I mean, his hands were amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you see some of those videos of him just doing hand technique, it was, you know, it just blows you away. It's just so beautiful. Yeah. Cause he practiced a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? I feel like it's, He's born with it, but also this guy was just a, I mean, his life is drumming, obviously. And I think he play. I think the other thing that, that, um, you know, we learned from Dave's episode is he actually played all the time. He sat in all the time, Yeah. you know, so he was playing a lot and then he was hanging out and playing and, you know, um, sitting in all the time. So it wasn't just practicing, but he did practice, but it was actually, he was going out and getting that experience playing with people. Yeah. Um, and I think that was another thing that, that he learned about. And the other thing that he, he in, incorporated into his, his technique and his playing and his ability, you know, having sure. that confidence. Well, he says with miles that he was just, he was able to do whatever he wanted. Miles didn't police him and he mm-hmm. had all this confidence from that. He, you know, miles was his idol and he just let him play. He goes, 
I'm not going to tell you anything. That was Miles' philosophy is I'm not going to give you direction. You just do what you do. Yeah, man, that's a great way to put it. And when Miles Davis says, do what you're going to do, just do it. Uh, he's not known as the like friendliest of guys to be <laughs> supportive. So Tony was like on the inner circle there for sure. So um, shall we continue on here to uh, number three, bass drum feathering? Yeah. So part of my lessons, and I, I uh, did study with him privately in um, at the, the Drum World uh, store in San Francisco, and he had a 24-inch bass drum. So he had, uh, I went over this with Garrison. He had the 24-inch bass drum, you know, a snare drum, a ride cymbal, hi-hat. And this is what I remember. I don't remember the whole kit being set up. Um, so you would play fast swing and um, you would have to feather the bass drum. And he didn't want to be able to hear the bass drum. And you play the hi-hat on two and four. And um, the technique was playing heel down. And so if your bass drum was too loud, he'd go, no, you're, I can hear the bass drum. I don't want to be able to hear that. And so mm. that was so challenging, you know, to be able to do that. But apparently this is a traditional thing that um, he talks about the early days that, that we played quarter notes on the bass drum. They played it real loud to uh, help the bass player out, you know, with the pulse. And then later on, they, they bring the volume down to a, a whisper, right? Um, mm -hmm. So in the, in the clip, he talks about how he always feathers the bass drum. You may not hear it. But you feel it's like uh, almost having like ghost notes where you don't hear it, but you feel it, it adds feel to the groove. Hmm. So this is what this clip is about. Cool. Here we go. You can, you can play it just a cymbal. You can play the hi-hat. You can play with the bass drum. Um, and I had to learn, or I thought it necessary to learn, how to play like swing time or straight jazz time. With, in the traditional sense that it started out with, see the, the whole thing started out like with the, with the like the Charleston beat, like you know the old Charleston beat. So and it and it dove into you know swing time like that. But the basic way for a drummer to play it is four four on the bass drum. And after a while, I guess in like the late forties. In the early 50s, that became less, you know, drummers played that less and less, you know, the bass drum on 4 4, or you heard it less and less. But it's still necessary, you know, like when drummers used to go. Like Great sound. <laughs> so the idea, excuse me, wait a minute. The, the idea is what I'm just, what I'm trying to say is. You still got, I mean, that's part of it too. Even at fast tempos, I play the bass drum. You don't hear it, but I'm playing it like this. Boy, he's got some serious, the dynamics there of the bass drum are just amazing. Where my takeaway from that is like, instead of just doing the same volume the whole time, it gives you somewhere to go when you feather the bass drum like that. Like if you bring it up, it means something, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of dynamics and, and um, you know, a lot of feel. And then, you know, of course, his up-tempo swing was just out of this world. Um, yeah. Uh, that um you know i i don't know anybody else that can do that you know like with that that to me it's always been very pleasurable uh, i i grew up with tony when i in a young age and i grew up in the fusion era but he his sound was always so pleasurable to me you know um yeah and, and kind of another theme of, of of his lessons is everything he played made sense he didn't play anything that was um you know, something that would just, just for the sake of playing chops or, um, throwing something in or speed or, or, um, you know, ideas, everything that he did 
was very clean and even and made sense. And it was very musical. So, you know, when you're hearing him play that up-tempo swing, I mean, it's, it's just so amazing. And the ideas yeah. and the stuff he throws in, um, you know, to, to me, it's just, it was so attractive and inspirational. And it's like, you knew it was yeah. him. Oh my God. It's like, I don't want to say chaotic, but it's clear and it makes sense. You know what I mean? It's just very like, it's just like classic. It's just impressive. <laughs> like to any non-drummer, drummer, whoever, musician, non-musician, it's just like, that is, that is beautiful. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's, it's this, you can tell it's him and, and he has that, that style, you know, um, like I said, it's, it's beautiful and it's, it's distinctive and it grabs you. Yeah, for sure. Here we go on playing the symbol. Yeah, that, that's because you can practice, you know, from practicing the simplest things, what I'm saying, like even the time on the symbol, I, I used to spend days just doing nothing but just the symbol, you know, just playing that. Because if, because, okay, the, playing even is a big, plays a big part in how I sound, you know, because I can play a number of things at one volume like this. I, I'll give you an example. <laughs> It's all the same volume. That's important to be able to do that. I mean, it sounds simple or it sounds maybe not exciting, but it doesn't sound hip. You know, you're not getting any groove from that, but it's really important. So when you can play one thing for a long period of time, it makes that one thing like a metronome. It makes the, re the reason I play the way I play, the reason I raise my stick up is because this has become the metronome. So everything else, people ask, how do you play polyrhythms? It's just because when you practice the simple things and knowing where they are, everything else becomes, you know, then you can do what you want. But anyway, I used to practice like this. Do that for long periods of time just that so that and then what i did was it's almost like chanting or meditation you, know, you sit there and all of a sudden you keep doing I, I would keep doing this and all this music i just start hearing all this music so if this would fit in with what i'm hearing and i never changed it i never played like <laughs> I don't play like that, you know. That's not. That's, so it's just because the music is, is is there. You don't have to play music. I mean, I don't mean that. I mean, it's see. So if I can get a good feeling from doing that, I'm doing myself a bigger favor than if I spend all day going. You know. Man, it's like chanting or meditating. That is like the coolest thing ever, and it. That's just a different way to look at practice right there, you know, instead of it, just get in the zone and God, you know what I mean? Just really just do it over and over and don't be thinking about when you're going to stop. I mean, that's just such a huge just theory. When I, when I heard this, the, these clips stay in my mind um, and I remember going to my dorm room. And just setting up my ride cymbal. And we weren't supposed to practice in the dorm rooms at Berkeley. But I just mm. set up my ride cymbal and I put on um I put on a track and just play along with it. So I I literally just the ride cymbal, practice along, just taking that philosophy to heart. And um, you know, it really, really helped me. You know, just just yeah. working on the ride cymbal. Um, the other thing I want to say that is um, you see a lot of clips on YouTube where in that clip, he says, I don't play like that with the, you know, he kind of has the phrasing. So I don't know if you've heard some of the miles stuff where he does this crazy ride symbol phrasing that nobody really knows what that is. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just, you know, is it eighth notes? Is it swung? Is it straight? Is it, you know, is it, is it phrasing? But when I was taking lessons, he's, he says, I don't do that. Hmm. So, I um, came to the conclusion that he didn't do that anymore. 
or he'll say, um, if I want to do that, I'll do that. But, you know, I, I can play this way and I can maintain this ride symbol. And if I choose to do something, I would, you know, if I, if I want to do something different, I will. Uh, yeah. But he's really pertaining to keeping his ride symbol steady and using that as the foundation of everything. And he goes on to say yeah. how that helped him with, with different styles of music as well. So that's kind of the contradictory piece that you were talking about before, where it's like, like you said, I don't do that anymore. But he's saying, I don't do that. It's like, well, you did do it for a long time. So, I mean, I guess he's, it seems like when he's done with something, he's done it. And then he's moving on and he's working on what would maybe be considered, like he said, oh, that's easy, but it's not easy. You can perfect it. You know what I mean? It, maybe it seems harder to da 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 like really go nuts with the the pattern. But boy, interesting. He's a he's a deep a deep guy. That's for sure. Yeah, but you did like I was saying before that you know all the different periods he went through, right? For and sure. so and so he had the period that you know he did play with the broken ride pattern, and then mm -hmm. he went to the period. If you look at the um, you know later period with the quintet, he he played straight. You know the the ride symbol was straight. You know, so um, I think he just had all these different periods he went through, right? Yeah. And then he would just say, "I don't do that," or um, um, "I I this is this is how I play," or or maybe he'll say something, "I I don't do that anymore." So it's like the contradictory. Um, sometimes it's like. Well, it did happen, and everybody's trying to figure that out. Everybody wants to figure out what he did on Nefertiti. Everybody wants to mm -hmm. figure out that time period of, you know, what was going on then? Like what, yeah. you know, um, you know that that's that stuff that was just magical that happened at that time. You know, like what was that all about? Everybody, everybody tries to figure it out, but we can't. It's just, you know, it's Tony. It's the it's the thing <laughs> yeah. that was happening at the time that was so magical. Yeah, and he's already off and done and onto something else. Yes. Cool. All right. So the next clip, similar uh, vein is the ride symbol independence. Yeah. And this, this is where he, he talks a, li a little bit about how the ride symbol was, you know, how he keeps the ride symbol as a foundation and everything else evolves around it. And he talks about the different levels of um, volume with the snare drum and the hi-hat and the bass drum. So he's talking about the grand scheme of things as having the mixing board of of the volume of the instruments mm, awesome here we go oh no i worked at independence too yeah but there's a way you know <laughs> like i heard miles and i played a lot of independence also keep your hand right that's mind. the idea okay when i started playing all right all right when i started playing the idea was to be able to play the ride symbol and that's how what you hear i mean what you hear on the records that's what this is where the time is so the idea was to play everything without changing it. See, I couldn't play the way I, the other stuff I play, like the, the, you know, if I didn't first, line. That's what Alan, da I mean, Alan Dawson could do that. Alan Dawson could do that to a kid nine years old. I mean, I mean, and I'm not, you know, I mean, my arm is down, my shoulder's down. And I'm just sitting here playing from the hand. I don't, my, my technique involves not the wrist. It's not arm and, and wrist, it's just the hand. See, when I play around the drums, if I go, when I got over here, I'd be tired. But hands play so much, I can come back, I can go. You know, and I can do that all day. I can play like that because of the hands. So the same thing with the cymbals. I'm 
try to play things in different ways, you know, put them on different and do it. I mean it that way. I mean, so that then, then what happens is, what I've done is, I've got this thing that I can always, and I know always know where I am. You know, and, and if I read, like with the sim, another thing about the sim, you play like this, you'll never get better. The idea is to practice things, so the way to play the cymbal is... You know, the hand, my hand stays in one place. The arm stays in one place. But the stick comes all the way back. It almost hits me in the face a lot of times. The thing I got out of that, too, was the the sense of the metronome, the cymbal being the metronome, and and how the energy and, and the recording... Of course, it's it's a tape recorder of the day, and you could hear the the, the squelching that that would would squash the 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 uh, wash of the cymbal. But yeah, you know, he really had the thing of the cymbal was was this constant, um, you know, uh, ostinato, and he was keeping that going, and he could play all that stuff over it, and so that was mm-hmm. really the key to that, and how he was saying just the metronome of how the stick would swing back. So he was getting that almost like tick tock, like that uh, yeah. back and forth motion that would keep the time. So he was really emphasizing that in that in that audio clip. Yeah, I've never really thought about that with playing, about using that as your I mean, obviously we you know, you you use your right hand as kind of the the timekeeping sort of, you know, thing, but um boy, to really think of the motion of it, that's uh, it's deep. You know, he's got a very uh, I don't know, a uh, great perspective on everything. It's really cool to, to hear that. Yeah. And it's the swing, you can kind of relate that to the stick coming back and swinging back and forth and, and yeah. getting the, you know, getting the swing feel. So it, it does really, um, you know, pertain to, to the whole concept. Yeah. It's neat. In a lot of these episodes, there's been things about, about teachers and great drummers where like you may be doing something, your whole life of drumming, but like then you hear the way one of these guys describes it and it makes you think differently. Like you might not change the way you're playing, but you're thinking differently and feeling it differently. And that's that's the beauty of hearing these these techniques of, of guys like Tony. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay, so moving on here, um, where do you want to jump from there? Uh, let's go into uh, pedaling the hi-hat. Okay. So uh, just setting this up, you know, Tony had a left foot thing that, that um, it's, it's unbelievable. And to me, I, um, I always struggle with my left foot. You know, I, I, I grew up playing this big, huge kit and um, my, my left foot was always the, the thing that suffered the most. And Mm -hmm. Tony had this, this amazing, you know, he had amazing feet, but just the left foot with these things you would do with the hi hat and um, doing things of playing quarter notes or eighth notes on the hi-hat through everything or doing um, like I did a video on the sweeping of the hi-hat and getting, you know, all this beautiful, you know, textures and, and, and sound, you know, out of the hi-hats that I don't think anybody was doing, you know? Um, And he had that ability to do that. Now in the lessons I asked him specifically about like, how did you, how did you come up with this? And he said, I, I didn't practice it. He goes, it just happened. He'd say like, mm. I willed it to happen, but he didn't, <laughs> you know, specifically practice these things. Um, he did talk about doing heel toe. I don't know if you've ever heard of that technique mm-hmm, where you go sure. up and down, rocking your foot. He did have me do that. But, um, you know, this, this kind of thing of, of, you know, his, um, I guess playing heel up and then, uh, pedaling the hi hat and he, and he calls it down force is like this whole nother level. And at the time, nobody was doing this, you know, this, hmm. this kind of at Berkeley, people were starting to play like quarter notes and eighth notes when I was at school. But, um, this was something that started to be a norm as we see in drumming now. Yeah. And that's kind of the, everyone is always chasing their left foot. Obviously there's people who are amazing with their left foot right out of the gate, but we're all, I don't know, we, we, we're all chasing that independence with our left foot, you know, and that, that ability to do these little kind of techniques and, and, and little like flourishes with the hi-hat. So, uh, so I'm excited to hear this. So, okay, this is pedaling the hi-hat. 
I just play like that because I can play like this. You know, I don't have to play like that. Mm -hmm. so I play like that. Now, this stuff. real downforce, more downforce. And it just happens that because I started playing like this, I was able to start playing. Like that. Hmm. Man, such control. Yeah. It's like it's a stick. It's like it's his hand. You know what I mean? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It, it, it was something that um, totally changed my life and, and uh, practicing that. I want to say that um, when I was at Berkeley, there was, um, you know, we had drum rooms and, and they made, they actually had reconstructed, um, you know, did, did a whole reconstruct of the practice rooms when I was there about um, 1983. And um, there was a bunch of drummers that would come through and teach us, right? They would just, people would show up, you mm. know, and some would be these old time, you know, drummers, you know, uh, one guy I think hung out with Tony, his um, name was Lenny Nelson, and he would do all these like Max Roach things and, you know, the, all these like power exercises and whatnot. Uh, but there was another guy that I grabbed onto, his name was Robbie Gonzalez, who was playing with Al Demiola at the time. And, um, you know, he didn't have, I think he was living in, in Miami or something like that, but he was playing with a band called Tigers Baku. So, um, uh, I was living in, in a suburb of Boston and a duplex, we call it the legend of hell house. And, uh, <laughs> we, we had like a basement and he would come over to my house and we would take lessons and he would, he would, uh, you know, really work on my feet, you know, and, and I started to get into, uh, playing heel up. Like I didn't, nobody even taught me that growing up you know so um he was getting into working like lifting your heel working on your left foot working on independence working on technique and then tony of course had this um he had been doing this forever so it kind of carried that on of, of you know he talks about the downforce and 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 how he how he was pedaling the hi-hat and keeping those quarter notes going those eighth notes going and then doing different things with open hi-hat um so i think that you know, that whole thing is, is kind of going into this whole, almost, um, you know, this, this foundation of the feet. Yeah. Which, I mean, everyone works on their hands a lot. There's kind of a, the theory that like, you know, your left foot maybe gets, if you're, if you're right handed, kind of right footed with your kick that your left foot sort of gets left for last, you know, which shouldn't be the case, obviously, which you're talking about, you worked on it and, um, it's, it's some about your left foot, if that's not your do dominant foot, it just it sort of like what he's saying about traditional grip. It feels uncomfortable. It's like you get this feeling of like it's like frustrating. It's like, ah, just like work correctly if you're trying to do independence and keep your left foot going with, you know, quarter notes or whatever. It's just like it can drive you nuts. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I know I used to do is I would set up weird and my uh, my left foot was I, I try to put all these toms up and my left foot would be way off, you know, to the, to oh, the, yeah. I, I would, I would sit wrong and I would, I would not really utilize my left foot because I was sitting so weird and my left foot was so far off to, to the left side of my kit. Um, yeah. Tony also talks about how he sets up where everything's really even, like his feet are even and his hands are even. So he's able to access things. And it's weird. My Japanese roommate who I actually found a, I, I found him on, on Facebook after like what, 35 years or 40 years, <laughs> you know, he used to teach me that. Cause we, you know, he would say, you know, you got to set up with your, your, your feet even. So your right foot and your left foot are relatively even with each other. You're not, one's not in front of the other. So I think that's yeah. another thing that allowed, you know, Tony to play with, you know, this great technique that he, he had his feet set up, you know, in a very logical place. You know, that I, I, when I was a yeah. kid, I was just dumb. I didn't know that, oh, well, maybe I should do this. I was just trying to put everything in. I know those huge, I had a, I used to have a huge giant kind of Ludwig set. And it's like, uh, you look at it now and I'm like, okay, so my, 
like the double, the two bass drums, my feet were already pretty wide, then put a hi-hat on there. And it wasn't one of the two leg kind of hi-hats where you see so you'd have to do the the thing where you close the legs and you clamp it onto the bass drum with one of those little like connectors. And I mean, you're, you're le- like, for me, my legs were so far open. It was like, yeah, you're either playing, you're clamping down the hi-hat or you're playing open. <laughs> like there's not much technique there on a 10 piece drum set. Right. I, I grew up that way with playing the, the big, huge kit, because I think all the drummers when I was growing up played huge kits. So, you know, Billy Cobb and Carl Palmer, um, Lenny White, everybody had huge kits, you know. So yeah. that was the thing, man, to have as much stuff as you could. But, you know, mm. later on, I just I got rid of it all. Uh, I remember when I first went to Berkeley, I shipped everything off and and like, I, you know, you had lockers, you know, it's like, I can't set this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. sent it all back home. You know, I just went uh, down to like a mini, just a normal kit, you know, and, and yeah. stupid me. That's, that's what I should have done from the start, but I was so stubborn. It's like, no, I have to, this is my sound. Yeah. I need 15 toms. <laughs> right. Uh, but you know, you learn about, um, playing, you know, with nothing like playing with a, a bass drum, a hi hat, a snare drum and a ride cymbal. That's yep. a really good way of practicing. Exactly. Everything on top of that can be extra, but really you can't hurt yourself by having too much and start walking like a, you've been riding a horse for uh, 30 years if you're, <laughs> you're too too wide with the bass drums. Right. Um, all right. So I think we have time for a few more. I mean, this is just so cool. And uh, I mean, it's just amazing to hear Tony talk about these. Um, these, these It's just so cool to hear from him directly. Um, I love how you chopped up this clinic. So where do you want to go from there? Uh, let's go into the um, uh, the brushes. Okay. So this is a short little audio, and uh, this talks about something I never knew about, of, of throwing the snares off. Okay, here we go with uh, Tony talking about brushes. The snares are supposed to be off, basically. Oh, really? Yeah. The best way to play brushes is the snares off. heard about that really never well that's what you're paying me for so explain that so he's saying your traditional kind of brush work you go snares off yeah you know he played the black dot heads so um what he said he would do is he would switch out the snare drums with with a you know a coated surface and he had said that yeah i always play with the snares off now i had at the time I'd never heard of that, you know, um, obviously there are different textures with turning the snares on or off, but he exclusively played with the snares off. And I Mm -hmm. think that was a, uh, you know, just something, a a revelation for me. It was like, wow. And that's, you can hear me kind of going, I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Oh my God. Do you think that's possibly Like at one point he did play with the snares on kind of thing, like a contradiction maybe where earlier on he did it and then he evolved his sound. Or do you think that was a full on, he always did it like that sort of thing? Uh, it, it, I don't know. You know, I, I, uh, it's hard to tell. Um, I obviously when you hear the recordings later on, you could, you could hear that the snares are off. Um, and, and, and you're definitely hearing that sound. Um, maybe earlier you couldn't tell. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a cool. really good question. No, interesting. That's a really practical, easy thing for people to do instead of, you know, everything else we should go and practice. But with that, you can just flip your throw off off and, uh, <laughs> just start playing with brushes. Okay, cool. Where do we go from there? Let's go to the, um, consistently listening to himself. Keeping time. Keeping time audio. Yeah. Yeah. Just get a tape recorder and listen to yourself. And, and, and if you learn to listen to yourself and criticize yourself and say, that's not sounding good, you know, and you got to find, and why? And then you analyze it. Why isn't that sounding good? Like I said, the, re- the way I did it was I just sat there and played time. No beats, no rhythms. And then when you could sit, someone, Cl- Clifford Jarvis told me years ago, friend, uh, Cl- Drum- Drummer, he said, he said, just sit there and you play the time. And when you can play the time and you feel good yeah. back from it, then you got it. Because if I sit there and I go. <laughs> or 
or even without the hi hat. If you do it long enough, you'll it, it'll become very strong. I mean, I can't express I can't express it strongly enough how much that works. If you, if the idea is to sit there and you draw a feeling back from it, when you can do that, you you you're on your way. I mean, because that's what it's all about. It's not the beats. It's not all the stuff in between. Believe me. I mean, because because I've heard people that can play amazing things, but it sounds like it sounds terrible because they don't. There's nothing. There's no frame around it. You can play all of all the wonderful rhythms in the world, but you know, it's not necessarily music. Yeah, one of the things that that he taught me in the lessons was he listened to himself play, and he listened to others around him, and he was he was really. We talked about taping himself. He would really try to critique his playing, and and uh, as he goes on, he says, "I don't play stuff." And I've kind of said that before. He doesn't play stuff he doesn't mean. He always he's always listening and listening to everything around him, and really making sense of everything he does. So it's it's sure. not like he's just playing. He's he's really mindful of everything going on, and I got a lot out of that. And the taping yourself is is such a great exercise. I think everybody should do that. Um, I I like I was saying, I was obsessed with it. I was tape, taping every gig I did, listening back. If somebody tells you something's wrong, you go back and you listen. Like was I was something wrong with the time? You know what happened? Did somebody drop a beat? Did I drop a beat? Did 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 the bass player do something? Was he was was um, were we feeling something different here? Or um, did I play something that? that wasn't good. Like he talks about that doesn't sound good or, or something where, Oh, that did sound good or that works. Yeah. That doesn't work. So I think out of that clip and, and the studies with him, I got a lot out of out uh, listening to yourself and, and critiquing yeah. yourself and, and listening back and listening to others around you and really you being the judge of yourself, not just listening to other, other people telling you like maybe growing up where people are telling you what you should be doing. Yeah. And I mean, God, it's never been easier than now with your cell phone and your a little zoom, you know, recorder or whatever, just set it up and record yourself. That's, uh, it's a great way to, to improve, to hear yourself back. So that's smart of you to bring the recorders with you and, and do all that. It, it took a couple extra minutes, which a lot of times for people, that's a couple extra minutes they don't want to spend. So it, it worked out well for you. Yeah. And, uh, would the Sony Walkman had come out then? This is this is dating myself, but that was that was the greatest tool. You know, we go to drum clinics or everything. We we could tape everything. You know, before that they had like a reel to reel. They didn't really have good portable cassette recorders that that yeah. were were as as portable. You know, and these little Walkman things. You you know, we used to take the train and everything, and you could listen to your music. Now we just listen to our phone, like you said. Sure. Everything's on the everything. phone. The phone is the <laughs> utility knife, the Swiss Army knife. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, for the sake of time, how about we pick two more? Does that sound good? Sound great. Um, okay, let's go up to um, number 14, Setting Up Far Away. Okay, all right, here we go. You setting Up Far Away. Like my drums are all... If I set my drums up to make it easy on myself, like people do, pull it all in because I can get to it easier, <laughs> that's great, but I'll never get better. But if my drums are at a point where I have to reach for them, then that means that my body is always in motion. So you make your body, I've my, my, made my body sort of into the uh, uh, mechanism so that everything's all, it's like when I practice and I do like that, then I've got this, like it's like a pulley, like a weight, you know, like a weight sort of thing. So it's, so you make yourself, I'm, I've always made myself always, uh, I'm always ready. Or in, you know, and the way you play and the way you sit tells you a lot you know, about how you're going to sound. Because if I were playing, and I were playing like this, I mean, I might, I might just I say, wow, that really, really feels good. Why well, I'm really going to groove now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, that means. <laughs> <laughs> but, but subconsciously, something inside is going to be saying, "Boy, well, you're comfortable, aren't you?" You know. So consequently, you're going to sound uncomfortable. Give myself the most uh, best chance of sounding good from the very beginning, from the point I sit down 
I have a better chance of sounding good if like when I pick up the sticks, I go, I sit there and my, and my feet are like the same. When I look down, my knees are in the same place. Like, like I'm not sitting like that. And like I'm sitting straight my knees are, and I sit like that. My hands are like, I go like this. And I put, I didn't, I didn't sit down and go, all of a sudden I just sit down. Something inside is going to be saying, boy, you're comfortable, aren't you? You know, so consequently you're going to sound uncomfortable. Give myself the most, uh, best chance of sounding good from the very beginning, from the point I sit down, I have a better chance of sounding good if like when I pick up the sticks, I go, I sit there and my, and my feet are like the same. When I look down, my knees are in the same place. Like, like I'm not sitting like that. And like I'm sitting straight, and I sit like that. My hands are like going like this. And I put, I didn't, I didn't sit down and go. All of a sudden, I just sit down. Man, that is like one of the truest things I think I've ever heard. It's just like you're just you're setting yourself up for such better success when you you sit down and you're comfortable. I mean, we all know that feeling when you sit down and you're like this is wrong. <laughs> like I'm an inch off on the hi hat. I'm just uncomfortable. It's not right. Oh man, that is so such a simple way to put it. Yeah, and I think the other thing that he was talking about is he he actually purposely set up where things were far away. They weren't close to him. He sat yeah. high. He liked to be yeah. towering over the drums, but he liked to have everything far away and he had to reach for it. Um, he played with two B drumsticks mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, so, uh, you know, that, that's an amazing thing that um, uh, I was talking to John Chris, uh, De Christopher about, you know, they, they had a Zildjian model, um, a, a signature model that they made for him, but two B drumsticks and he played everything with Huge. two B drumsticks. Wow. Amazing. So he, <laughs> yeah. he, he tried to make things that, that were challenging for himself. Yeah. God, it's like, what a natural talent where like things are getting too easy. Let me use these baseball bat sticks <laughs> and like just make things just a little bit challenging. That's that's neat. But also on that note, he's sitting down and he's not. I just love that, you know, your drum set. We all know that feeling, though, of it's just it's got to be just right. So it's yeah, that's really powerful. OK, last clip here. Which one do you want to go to? Let's go to number 16. Excellence. All right, here we go, number 16. I'm not here to play perfect. I'm not a perfectionist at all. I'm after excellence. You know, excellence is what I strive for. And I can only do that if I'm happy and relaxed. And, 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 and I know that, that I can play. I know I can play the drums. I've never had a problem playing the drums. So I'm only telling you these things because I've never had a problem. The only problems I've had was with the drums themselves. If I didn't have like the right cymbals or the right hi hat and stuff like that. That bothers you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I can play on anybody's stuff. I'm saying when I was younger, I used to listen to a record with Art Blakey on it. And I, I wonder, God, how come my set doesn't sound like that? And then I saw his set and I said, oh, now I know, you know, my shit was just, you know, I had a bag of nuts and bolts and old sound symbols and stuff. Hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Wow. It's so neat, too, that like Tony being such an icon, he looks at those guys. He looks at the Art Blakeys and the Max Roaches and, and has that sort of like just love for them and you know uh i just love that you're it's like your hero's hero you know right and he he talks about how that shaped him um and and how you know he from listening to those guys and seeing those guys and being friends with those guys you know he used that as you know his his mentorship growing up right yeah. Now, he also yeah. talks about how he took things from each one of those drummers and he goes through a wide range of drummers. Uh, but, you know, the influence of Max Roach, Art Blakey, um, uh, Philly Joe Jones, um, uh, Roy Haynes. He talks about how he took stuff from all those guys. He could play just like them, but 
what he did is he took the things that he uh, were he felt was encompassing his style and he threw away everything else. Hmm. So he took the stuff that he could use and he got rid of everything else. But he could play just like those guys. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, and I've got yeah. more audio that maybe we'll share later of him playing just like his heroes. Yeah. But, uh, what an amazing yeah. thing that he can assimilate that and then and then say, well, I'm going to take this and I'm going to throw everything else away. Yeah, that's because otherwise, uh, not, not that there's anything wrong with it, but if, you, if you're just taking everything you're copying them and you're going to sound like an imitation of them, but he's, he's picking and choosing and creating this, uh, beautiful Frankenstein of all of his heroes, um, to create the sound of Tony Williams really. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it, it's, it's such an amazing thing that, you know, he, he took this tradition and he's passing this tradition on and, and we're able to, you know, get so much out of it. Even today, you know, he's been gone for what over twenty years. Mm -hmm. What has it been? So um, he is still influencing everybody. You know, people are still yeah. talking about him, and I think that's such an amazing thing. You know that that his spirit is still alive. Yeah, very much so. And I think people like you, his students, are are passing it along. Um, God, these these I've done a couple of them where these clip episodes where we play clips from things it just they fly by I mean I think anyone listening is thinking holy cow it's been an over an hour um so um like Rob mentioned we are gonna do a bonus episode where we're gonna actually hear these clips um of Tony imitating uh Max Roach Philly Joe Jones Art Blakey and Elvin Jones um which I'm super excited to to hear and kind of dig into those a little bit um so we'll do that on the bonus episode. If you want to hear that stuff, you can uh, join up, go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a little Patreon button and you pay a little couple bucks extra a month and um, you get stuff like that. But um, Rob, this is just so cool. Why don't you tell people a little bit more about you and where they can find you and taking lessons and, and all that good stuff? Great. My website is www.robhartdrumstudio.com. And my goal is to pass on the tradition that I've attained from the greats. And I've been working on a compilation of music courses and now just completing my third course, currently editing down 30 hours of video and audio footage accompanied with PDF lessons that contains rhythm, reading, theory, detailed hand and feet technique, and groove independence, and much, much more. Thank that's you. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. People love that stuff with the show. Um, so again, that's Rob Hart Drum Studio dot com. H A R T. Well, Rob, um, just I can't thank you enough for taking the time to chop up these clips. And uh, I'm excited to go through more with you and uh, have some more fun in the Patreon bonus episode. Um, so you're really doing a great thing by continuing on Tony's legacy. And, and I've never really had a, a explanation of these clinics and maybe we do this more with other drummers on the show with uh, other people who took lessons with them. Cause this has just been awesome. I think you've really brought a cool um, new perspective to, to this podcast and especially. Yeah. And I want to say Bart that I reached out to you. Uh, usually people probably get recommended to you. Uh, sure. I got addicted to your podcast. I, I, <laughs> you know, is exercising every day and, and, and I put your podcast on and, and it's, and I binge listen to it and it's so great. You know, with the things that you're doing, the services that you're doing and the history is just so amazing. And like well, I was telling you. you before that, um, you know, I'm getting different drummers. Um, I'm turning them on to your podcast. Steve Smith has listened to it and he goes, Oh, did you hear of that one about, uh, you know, the Joe Morello or, uh, the <laughs> oh, Freddie cool. Gruber and, and so, wow. you know, it, it's, it's such a great thing you're doing. And so, oh, thank um, you. you know, I'm, I'm really inspired by, by listening and I'm, I've almost got through al almost every episode. Oh, wow. I love hearing that. I like, there's some people who are updating me on, uh, on that where they go. And I literally, while we're talking, I got a message from someone saying, Hey, I just did the PV episode about PV drums. I love it. So it's cool to hear that people are going through, uh, which man, I don't take that for granted. I I've done that with other podcasts where I just, I feel like I need to hear every single one, you know? So word of mouth is the best thing. You know, you, you trust your drummer friends and the fact that people such as yourself are sharing it is just so cool. So I appreciate it and appreciate you sharing your knowledge with me today. 
Awesome, Bart. Thank you. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.